Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Namaste. Welcome to episode 140 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for half an hour, I'm going to be ranting away at things uh, that uh, I think are important enough for you to know about. Have any reactions to the show? Email me. The email address is whoviating, W H O V I A T I N G, at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark time and you can comment there or you can get the email address from there. Uh, if you do email me as always please include something in the subject line so I know it's not spam and uh, be a little patient. I can be a little slow about answering my email but um, I do answer it. So anyway this I'm going to start by saying that um, it has not been a good week. It hasn't. I mean, there was some good news earlier was some good news earlier. The thing is, because of the holidays, last week's edition of Left Side of the Isle was actually prepared in advance. So while I get, did get to talk about the great news that uh, uh, New Mexico had become the 17th state to recognize same-sex marriage, I didn't make any mention about the related events in Utah and Ohio because those decisions came down after the show was prepared, even though before it aired. So. So I wanted to mention those two just briefly here. Uh, I do discuss them more fully at my blog, so if you want a more, uh, more in-depth discussion, just go there and, and look for that. Anyway, uh, in the case of Utah, U.S. District Judge Robert Shelby ruled that getting married is a fundamental right protected by the U.S. Constitution, and therefore the state, state of Utah's prohibition against same-sex marriage violates the U.S. Constitution. He dismissed the state's defenses for the law, um, which essentially were the same as those raised in New Mexico and which failed there as well. He called these uh, claims unsupported fears and speculations. Now, even though Utah actually has a state constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage, shall be ruled correctly that a state constitution cannot strip away rights guaranteed by the national constitution. Shelby's ruling is on a fast track for appeal to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which I've noted before is pretty generally regarded as the most right-wing, the most reactionary circuit court in the country. Um, so the decision could be uh, easily could be overturned, but it still it was encouraging on that grounds that the fact that the circuit court um, refused to stay the effect of Shelby's ruling pending the appeal. Now the Ohio case was on a much narrower point, uh, but the language used in the decision was was very important. In that case, Judge Timothy Black ordered Ohio authorities to recognize same-sex marriages on death certificates. So the thing is, Ohio does not recognize same-sex marriage. So uh, couples that were legally married in some other state and moved to Ohio, Ohio said, you're not married here. Well, some people wanted their marriages to be recognized on their spouse, spouse's death certificate, and that's what the suit was about. So the case, again, was on a narrow point. But the language that Judge Black used in handing down his decision was sweeping and emphatic. I'm quoting him. The question presented is whether the state can do what the federal government cannot, that is, discriminate against same-sex couples simply because the majority of voters don't like homosexuality, or at least didn't in 2004, which is when the ban was passed. Under the Constitution of the United States, the answer is no. No hypothetical justification can overcome the clear primary purpose and practical effect of the marriage bans to disparage and demean the dignity of same-sex couples in the eyes of the state and the wider community. Now, either either or both of these cases in, in um, Utah or Ohio could easily wind up before the Supreme Court, but um, no matter what happens, it is, again, more evidence that the long moral arc of the universe is, in fact, bending toward justice. Now, as a quick footnote to this, 
When the Supreme Court overturned parts of the Defense of Marriage Act, Judge uh, Antonin Scalia wrote a truly unhinged dissent, as part of which he wrote that by the majority's opinion's logic, uh, there would inevitably lead to state bans on same-sex marriage being struck down as unconstitutional as well. Well, in a delicious development, both Judge Shelby and Judge Black cited that remark in support of their decisions. Assume at least one of these cases gets to the Supreme Court. However they ultimately play out, it will still be a lot of fun watching Antonin Scalia try to deny the meaning of his own words. All right, but like I said, it hasn't been a good week. Uh, for one thing, and this may well have affected some of you out there directly, extended unemployment benefits for some 1.3 million American workers were cut off. They ended as of this past Saturday. A Merry Christmas to you too. Hundreds of thousands more among the unemployed are also going to see their benefits cut off by June if they, unless they're lucky enough to find one of those jobs that has eluded them so far, which actually doesn't seem very likely because studies have shown that employers do not like to hire people who have been unemployed for six months or more, even to the point of at least sometimes preferring people who have less relevant experience. The end result is that long-term unemployment has become a self-replicating trap even as we continue to have the highest long-term unemployment since World War II. Which means that this cut, this cut in unemployment benefits, is going to do the most damage to the people who can deal with it the least. The people whose resources have been de depleted the longest, whose um, employment prospects are in fact the bleakest. And this is part, by the way, this came about, this came about as part of that budget deal. You know the one that we're all supposed to celebrate because, hey, it's a compromise? That budget deal is what did this. That budget deal is what allowed this to happen. You know, the, under this program, the average stipend from the federal government uh, was $1,166 a month. That was the average. That is less than $14,000 a year, which is barely three-fifths of the federal poverty line for a family of four. And now even that's gone. So it's a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, too. Now, it's hard to gauge or quantify the effects of a cut like this on, on actual people because it just becomes a jumble of numbers and percentages and ratios and proportions and so on. But a recent study by the Urban Institute can give us some sense of the impact of long-term unemployment on actual people. The study found that workers who have been out of job for at 27 weeks or longer, which is the definition of long-term unemployed, Workers who have been out of a job for 27 weeks or longer uh, typically see their incomes fall by 40%. Even if they do find a job, it's usually a lower paying one with all the intended impacts on their future earnings. Uh, these workers, the long-term unemployed, tend to have worse health, higher rates of suicide, and greater strained relationship with their families. They see a massive drop in their self-esteem from the, the embarrassment, even the shame many people feel at uh, a sense that they're unable to fend for themselves or provide for their families. And in fact, those impacts can persist even to the next generation. The children of people who are long-term unemployed tend to do worse in school and earn less over the long run of their own lives. The Huffington Post actually looked at some individual people who were trying to cope with the end of their unemployment benefits, found people considering things like selling their cars, taking minimum wage jobs, which of course will not provide for a family, and that's assuming they can actually find such a job, slashing household budgets, raiding their retirement funds, maxing out their credit cards, pawning personal items, even moving. And by the way, here's a tidbit for you. Long-term unemployed, again, is defined as being out of work 27 weeks or longer. It now takes the average job seeker 35 weeks to find a job. And you want to know part of the reason this is happening? You want to know part of the reason why the inadequate official unemployment rate is still at 7%? 
Why there are still over 4 million long-term unemployed? Why is the recovery, so-called recovery, so stunted that it feels bizarre to even call it one? Well, here's one reason. Because we are so damn hung up on deficits that we are not willing, or more exactly, the combination of reactionaries and cowards that make up Congress and the White House are not willing to do what's necessary to actually make the investment in people and jobs. They are not was willing to face the fact that you cannot, well, you can't, if you will, austerity your way out of a recession. And over a million people just started paying an even bigger price than they already had been paying for that abysmal failure. All right, but while it hasn't been a good week here, it's been a worse week some other places. For example, Iraq. On December 30th, Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al malikai ordered his army to clear out a largely peaceful protest uh, in the city of Ramadi in Anbar, Anbar province in the western part of Iraq. The pro protests had been going on for several months. In fact, in a lot of ways, it resembled an Occupy encampment. It was to protest uh, the, um, what the largely Sunni region of western Iraq felt to be a pro-Shia sectarian agenda on the part of Malachi. The assault on the encampment produced heavy fighting between government forces and tribal, uh, tribal people. Reports are that at least 17 people were killed. And this was not the only violence in the Anbar region in recent days. Battles also broke out in other parts of the province, including the city of Fallujah. Now this all actually began last Saturday, when government forces stormed the Ramadi home of a Sunni lawmaker named Adman al-Alwani. They wanted to arrest him on some vague support of terrorism charges. It produced a shootout in which Alwani was wounded, his brother and at least five of his bodyguards were killed, and nearly 20 others, including some security officers, uh, were also hurt. Now, in response to the arrest and to the military campaigns in the region, 44 Sunni Arab lawmakers have resigned from the government in protest, while local political and tribal leaders are demanding that Alwani be released. Uh, in fact, Sunni leaders and clerics were also calling on all the other Sunni members of the government to resign in protest and calling on Shia parents to not let their sons take part in the military campaigns in Anbar. And uh, by the way, showing he has learned his lessons well from his former masters, Malachi said this was all about fighting Al-Qaeda and how ripping up the encampment was taking a safe haven away from terrorists. Now that claim was dismissed by a lot of folks in the region. In fact, one tribal fighter, Ramadi, uh, was quoted as saying of Malachi, he thought that he could deceive the world by talking about Al-Qaeda, but in reality he is fighting the Sunnis. The thing is, there has indeed been a, been a resurgence of violence, of terrorism in Iraq, of bombings of civilian targets and so on, including even in the, uh, in the uh, capital of Baghdad. In fact, over 8,000 people have been killed in sectarian violence in Iraq in 2013, the highest total since 2008. But the fact is, the blunderbuss tactics that Malachi is using are less likely to bring an end to such violence than they are to escalate it as more Sunnis take up arms, attacking government checkpoints and torching government vehicles and so on. And uh, negotiations between government officials on the one hand and Anbar provincial council members and tribal sheikhs on the other appear to be going nowhere. They appear to be failing. And the fact is that right now, today, Iraq stands on the edge of a renewed outright civil war. It has not been a good week. Finally, one more way in which it has not been a good, we uh, not been a good week. This, frankly, is something you may not know about, and even knowing about it, you may not care about it, but the fact is, I do. And it probably actually is the one of these that actually upset me the most. It's the case of South Sudan. I don't even know if you've ever heard of it. I mean, I'm reasonably sure you've heard of Sudan, but South Sudan? Yes, South Sudan. And that's part of the reason the whole thing makes me sad. 
The African nation of Sudan went through a 20-year civil war that set the Christian and traditionalist or animist uh, southern part of the country against the largely Muslim northern part. The war dragged on brutal year after brutal year. By the time it all ended, there were about 2 million dead, about 4 million more homeless. By the end of 2003, the war broke out in 1983, and by the end of 2003, both sides were exhausted in every sense of the word. People had finally, it appeared, had enough of war. Months of negotiations led to a draft peace settlement in June of 2004, the heart of which was a six-year period of autonomy for the South, followed by a referendum in that region on independence. Months of haggling over, over details ended in January of 2005. The deal was done. Peace, or really something approaching peace, appeared to be coming to Sudan after more than 20 years of bloodshed. In fact, people were so tired of war that when the leading figure among the rebels, who actually became vice president under this deal, uh, was killed in a helicopter crash some six months later. It didn't derail the agreement, nor did a brief outbreak of fighting in 2008 over a dispute about oil resources. Well, in January 2011, that uh, referendum was held in the southern part of Sudan. Over 95% voted for independence. South Sudan became a nation, the, new, the newest and today still the youngest nation on earth. Now, what you have to understand is that I followed this story. I did. I followed it through the first negotiations and the fighting, through the draft agreement, which looked like it would never come, through the final agreement, which looked like it would never come, through the multiple near breakdowns of the whole process, to the plebiscite, which at one time seemed so far off that it was like it would never come. I followed it. I followed it, and when two old rivals in the South, Rik Machar and Salva Kiir, joined together in the new government, in South Sudan with Kira as president and Mashar as vice president, it, it made me hopeful. But old rivalries die hard. On December 15th, Kir dismissed Mashar over some charges of attempted or perhaps imagined coup attempts. Old hatreds, old suspicions, such as those between uh, Kira's Dinka group and Mashar's Nur clan, uh, clan those kind of things need very little prompting, and now they had it. Bloodshed over the last couple of weeks has swept across South Sudan, with fierce battles reported in grimy parts of massacres, rapes, and killings. Reports now are that Mashar has gathered a force of thousands and is advancing on the major city of Bor, and Kir's army representatives are saying, more or less, bring it on. Hopes for a ceasefire are fading. So many years, so much hatred, so much blood, so much suffering for a time, it looked like it might actually be over. And now it looks like it was just a case of death pausing to tie its shoelaces. It really has been a bad week. Let's take a break. All right, and we're back. All right, and now we're going to take one of our regular weekly features. It's the Clown Award, given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. Now, you know, of course, about the case of Phil Robertson, the patriarch of the Duck Dynasty family, who was momentarily suspended from the show by A&E uh, because he expressed contempt for homosexuals, claiming all non-Christian societies are plagued with problems because no Jesus, and claiming that before the civil rights stuff came along, blacks in the South were singing and happy. Well, it only took a couple of days for A&E to offer its unconditional surrender to the banshees of the right, screeching about his First Amendment right to be in a cable TV show. But, believe it or not, A&E is not the clown here as much as they deserve to be. No, the clown is Ian Bain. He's a right-wing talk show host who is running for the Gopper nomination for a congressional seat in Illinois. Why does he deserve the big red nose more than A&E? Well, the network was just being a typical corporate craven coward. Mr. Bain went all the way in. Phil Robertson, he declared, was just like Rosa Parks. 
You remember Rosa Parks, the woman who helped to spark the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott uh, and through that the modern civil rights movement by refusing to give up her seat to a white guy in a bus like the law demanded that she do? You remember her? Well, in a fundraising email, Bain called Robertson the Rosa Parks of our generation. Well, because she took a brave stand, and so did he. She took a stand against persecution of black people, and he took a stand against persecution of Christians. Uh, that's right. According to Ian Bain, Christians in the present-day U.S., despite making up 78% of the population, are subject to the same level of persecution as blacks in the pre-civil rights South, and it took courage for Robertson to stand up for Christians. What's more, comparing Rosa Parks to Phil Robertson was, he said, a compliment to Parks. Yeah, can't you just imagine Rosa Parks if she was still alive going, he compared me to Phil Robertson? I'm so flattered. Uh, Bain went on subsequently to tell Talking Points Memo that the U.S. is a Christian nation uh, and predicted a dire future where, quoting him, we will wake up in an America where if you walk around with the Bible, you can be prosecuted. Which is why the courage of Phil Robertson was so wonderful. In fact, it was just like Rosa Parks. <laughs> now, two, two other things before I wrap this up. One is that the blogger known as Daisy Deadhead had some wonderful rant on her local radio, TV sh uh, local radio show where she pointedly noted that firing Phil Robertson because of what he said is exactly what the right wing wants the bosses to be able to do. They want the bosses to be able to fire you for any reason. You shouldn't have any protections of unions or any other such of protections. So what are they griping about? This is what they wanted. And two, the blunt fact is the whole crew of guys on Duck Dynasty a Duck Dynasty, rather, are phonies. They are bogus. They are fakes. The family are millionaires, and the whole bearded camel look is nothing but a costume to fool the rubes. You don't believe me? Here are some examples. Here's Brother Jace, then and now. Here's Brother Jep, then and now. And here's Brother Willie, then and now. So, number Ian Bain among the rubes, as well as a clown. All right, now, you know that I sometimes have a feature that I call and another thing, where I deal in something that's at least not expressly political, and usually it's some science thing or another that I found particularly cool. Well, sometimes I wonder why I bother. According to a poll released December 30th done by the Pew Research Center's Religion and Public Life Project, fully one-third of Americans reject the idea of evolution, insisting that, in the words of the question, humans and other living things have existed in their present form since the beginning of time. And it actually, to my mind, gets even worse. Now, 60% of Americans say that humans and other things have evolved over time. But when you break that figure down, it's not as good as it sounds. Only 32% of the American public accepts the fact that human evolution is, in the words of the question, due to natural processes such as natural selection. While 24% say, again quoting the question, a supreme being guided the evolution of living things for the purpose of creating humans and other life in the form it exists today. Now that same question was broken out by religious group. Now note this, this is, to me this is important. Of the six groupings they broke out, in only one case, the religiously unaffiliated, which I assume includes agnostics and atheists, uh, and only, only in that group does a majority of that group hold that evolution is a natural process not directed by some supreme being. That is the only breakdown in this whole poll where it can clearly be said that a majority, and even there it's not an overwhelming majority, it's a majority, but not an overwhelming majority, actually accepts the science. The harsh blunt truth is that we as a people, as a culture, as a society, we do not believe in science. We'll use all the benefits, we'll accept all the advantages we get, we'll, we'll pick up on all the convenience it produces, but we refuse to believe in the process. We refuse to believe what science tells us. Anytime it makes us the least bit uncomfortable, we resort to flat-out denialism. 
It's no wonder we still got so many nanny nanny naysayers about global climate change. We are really, really screwed. All right, I'm going to take a moment or two very quickly to uh, express some frustration. Two weeks ago, I told you about the declaration by U.S. District Judge Richard Leon that the NSA's massive spying program was significantly likely to be unconstitutional. But leave it to some on the left who find defeat even in victory. A writer at uh, Alternet called Stephen Rosenfeld declares the whole thing could backfire. Now, he spends a majority of his time actually attacking uh, the judge as a legal loudmouth and right-wing activist, but I'm not sure of the relevance since it remains true, as I said about the guy who brought the suit, that if it's the truth, what does it matter who said it? But apparently to Stephen Rosenfeld, it can only be the truth if the right sort of person says it. But anyway, there's still this claim that things could backfire. Well, how? Because the case could get to the Supreme Court, which may overturn it and declare that all the spying is legal. Now, it must be admitted that's a real possibility, but what's the alternative? Not to challenge the case at all, the thing at all legally, which still leaves it in place. As I said, leave it to the left to find long-term defeat in short-term victory. That is really frustrating. Anyway, that was all personal aside, but it does lead nicely into our last bit for this week. It's the outrage of the week. The same time I told you about Leon, I also told you about Willem Pauly in New York City, who a judge who expressed his concern about the collection of phone metadata. Um, he said that the hearing on it gave him a lot to think about. It turns out that thinking wasn't actually on his agenda. On December 27th, Pauly issued his ruling. This is an, by the way, this lawsuit was brought by the ACLU and challenged the constitutionality of the bulk data collection system about phone data. Well, Pauly dismissed the suit in a written opinion that essentially was a rehash of the government's arguments, one so shoe-licking that it must have left the spooks giggling like schoolchildren. Poland declared that the effectiveness of the program cannot be seriously disputed and said that despite the findings of a report issued by a panel of intelligence and legal experts established by President Obama to answer some of those same questions. That report found that, quoting, uh, that the metadata program made only a modest contribution to the nation's security and there has been no instance in which the NSA could say with confidence that the outcome would have been different without the metadata program in place. Judge Pauly either didn't know about that prospect, because maybe his judicial chambers are in a cave somewhere, or he just didn't care because he was so eager to swallow the government claims. He even claimed that the program not only is necessary and that it works, but it only works because it's massive and so enables the spooks to, and he actually said this, connect the dots. He even suggested that had it been in place, it could have pre prevented 9-11. <sighs> It's hard to imagine a more credulous, no, let me make that a more ignorant of reality judge than William Pauley. He and his decisions are both outrages. Going to wrap this up with our weekly reminder. As of December 31st, at least 12,001 people have been killed in this country by gunfire since Newtown, at least 98 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you can, a joyous and peaceful new year. We will see you next week. Peace.